mission trip and you do the work and you've gone out and been out for several years and you come back and then you get ready to go again, you always have got to rekindle the fire that you started. Because when time goes by, sometimes the fire begins to dwindle down and the sparks begin to get not as bright and you have to do some fanning and add some fuel. We looked at that last week, adding some fuel to the fire. And now we're going to have to go back and the second mission journey of Paul and them to rekindle some of the fire that was already started. So we've got to keep it going uh, for the Lord Jesus. So tonight we're looking at rekindling the fire. And I'll draw your attention to Acts chapter 15 tonight. We'll be looking at Acts chapter 15 and 16. These two chapters cover the second missionary journey. We've uh, tried to take the two chapters completely, paraphrase it into what you have, and so you have the basically two chapters there combined into your study notes tonight, and, and what that is is that you'll see as we move around in it, uh, that kind of gives you a little bit of the flow and the idea of what went on, what they did, where they went, and what happened. And you'll see some of the stuff, and of course, they're back at Jerusalem now, back at the church council and have brought back the reports of the work that's been done and what's been going on. And of course, there's always going to be some opposition and some challenge of the opposers, uh, because you still keep in mind, you know, Peter was the apostle to the Jews, and he was to take the gospel to the Jews, and Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and he was to take the gospel to the Gentiles. So we're trying to get Jews and Gentiles saved alike as God's trying to form his body called the church, the body of Christ, which all believers belong to, whether you're Jew or Gentile. And so you have a lot of stuff going on when people are getting saved out of different backgrounds, like in the Gentiles, for instance. You have the Greeks, and they're high in intellect and, and knowledge and that type of thing. And, and you have the Jews that are steeped rich in ritualism and Judaism and, and ceremonials and, and all of that stuff and the law and keeping that. And, and these people are getting saved, and yet they're bringing that in with them and then the Gentiles before they were saved they had a lot of pagan worship and so all of this is coming together and and so you know and they're learning that one gets saved by grace and grace alone and the Jews are having a problem with this you know they want to go back to the law and and to the rituals and ceremonials and and circumcision and all of that and they're literally wanting to put bondage a, a yoke on these gentile believers that are getting saved and uh, you know and it's not necessary they're not understanding that so this kind of give you an idea of what's kind of going on and what the missionaries are facing Paul trying to deal with his and Peter trying to deal with theirs and, and coming together. And so there's a debate in Jerusalem going on at the council about whether are we saved by grace and grace alone. And this is where it's all being decided as to which way it's going to go. Or do we get saved by keeping the law still and then adding that to grace. And see, if we do that, then we have a work salvation. And then it's no longer grace and grace alone. You see, now it becomes grace plus something. And so that's kind of going on, and so what's taking place. And so we read here in Acts chapter 15, verse 11. I draw your attention to you. And, but here's the, the text verse. But we believe that through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Okay? So that kind of gets us started there. So, Father, thank you for tonight. Bless our time in your word as we take another missionary journey with Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy and others that are in Barnabas that are involved in this uh, as we travel some 1,600 miles uh, tonight and 100 days and about $23,000 for this mission trip. And so, Lord, we help us as we travel on it this evening. Help us to open our eyes to see how important missions is how it was so important then as it is now, and we thank you for the decision that was made right uh, there by the leaders at the council that they chose to go with the fact that we're saved by grace and grace alone. And Father, we praise you for that and we thank you for that. 
And Lord, but help us to see where there's sometimes there's a challenge on the mission field. There's always a challenge before us with missions. The Father, help us to see that we need to, if we had any kind of fire or spark going in these last few weeks, if perhaps maybe uh, the rain has a, kind of dampened it a little bit and maybe put it out. Lord, help us to rekindle that fire this evening. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So we find ourselves at the council at Jerusalem. Chapter 15, verse number 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now you can understand what's going on. And you got Peter and Paul and all these guys, the disciples, they're here, they're the, the apostles, they're at the council. The council was made up of 70. There were 70 members of the council at Jerusalem, at the church at Jerusalem. By the way, James is the head of that. The half-brother of our Lord, James, he's the one that's heading up this church here in Jerusalem there, and he's there with them as well. And so this is going on, and Paul and them and Peter and them have gone out, and Jews have gotten saved, and Gentiles have gotten saved, and they've come back to give the report, uh, yet there's these Judaizers, there's these Hellenistic Jews that have come down from Judea, or actually to Jerusalem, they've come up uh, from Judea to Jerusalem, and said, no, no, no. We are strict to the law of Moses, and you must be circumcised, or you cannot be saved. Now, that's no different than many of the groups we have today. You must perform and do these works and do that and join this and sign up for this and all of this in order to be saved or in order to keep saved. And so thank God I don't have to do that to get saved, church, and thank God I don't have to do that to stay saved. You see, I'm kept, Peter says, by the power of God. My salvation doesn't depend on my performance of what I do or don't do or how I do it. Okay, It's not to get it nor to keep it. Because what in the world could we do to keep it? It wouldn't be a gift anyway. Somebody gives you a gift, it's a gift. And so thank God that's, uh, that's how we look at this. And so they're going on, and they're, uh, look at that. They, they said, except ye be circumcised. Now that's Jews, because that's what you had to do to be follow the law of Moses, you see. There was that outward uh, uh, circumcision. Well, see, our outward evidence of salvation or that we've been saved or identification is in the baptistry. That's where we identify with Christ, with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I died with Christ. The old man is dead. I'm buried with Christ, and I'm raised in a new life to walk in a new life with Christ. That's our identification. So thank God we don't have to go through all that stuff today. So Paul and Barnabas, so let's kind of get a look at it. Uh, Paul and Barnabas here at the council, uh, they're, going, they're, 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 they're in a sharp debate with these false teachers. Now, folks, mark it down, church, that any time we're going to do something for God, the devil's going to be right there, too. I can tell you, any time you try to step out by faith or do something for God or want to do something big for God, where you really got to step out and exercise your faith, the criticizers are going to be there. They're going to tell you you can't do it. It'll never happen. And, and on and on they go. Uh, or then are you trying to stick to true doctrine and you're going to have those that are come along and say, well, I don't believe in the Lordship of Christ. That's your problem. The Bible teaches that. When I got saved, he became my Savior and I, my Lord. Lord means boss, master, if you please. He's my Lord and Savior. He's the Lord of my life. That's the Lordship of Christ, and the New Testament teaches that. But we'll have those that will debate that and, and try to confuse you and mess you up with that and all this other stuff. So isn't it interesting that 2,000 years ago, no different than what's going on today. We fight the same problems today. We dealt with that in Ghana, in Africa. I mean, with, with many of the groups over there, uh, with, with all of this stuff, and it was just as bad there as it is here. And so you're, you're going to have that. So there's this debate going on, and it's about ready to split the church. See, that's what happens, folks, when false doctrine and false teaching comes in, and we have all this, you know what you end up getting? You get a split church. See, it splits the church. It splits the body of Christ. It's, it's about to happen within the church between the Jews and the Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas were sent to Jerusalem. 
They were sent up there from Antioch, the home, to home depart, depart from Antioch. You better get down there to Jerusalem, and, and you get into that council because there's problems going on. There's about to have a split here because we've got Jews that are getting saved by grace and faith that you taught, Paul, and that Peter taught, and then we have the others that say they've got to be circumcised in order to have it. Now, these are the Jews, and we're about to have a split. So down they go. So this is what happens, you see. That there's always going to be challenges in the ministry. And challenge in missions especially. So you just mark it down. But folks, work through it. You have to work through some of these things sometimes. You don't tur you turn your tail and run. You work through them. You don't hurt the body of Christ. You don't hurt the church, the cause of Christ, the work of Christ. You work it through it. You work it out. I mean, that's what mature spiritual people are supposed to do. That's what Christians are supposed to do. You don't run off and hurt the church and hurt the work of God and, and, and the things of God and the work of God simply because there's a disagreement or because something's been said or whatever. You work it out. That's what the Bible says we're to do. But what happens? Everybody takes off and takes half the church with them. And all you've done is split the church, hurt the church, the cause of Christ, the work of Christ, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And so what's the motive behind all that? If you have no biblical or scriptural ground, then what was the motive for doing all that? That's just an evil act is all that is. Don't tell me that two Christians that are saved can't work it out. So there's about ready to have a split. That's in verse 2. Look at verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas uh, had no small dissension and disputation with them, uh, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. What question? That you cannot be saved apart from circumcision. So that's what they were to go and investigate and get it. So we find out, and then we drop down to verse 7. Look at verse 7. And when there had been much disputing... Look at here, our brother Peter, Peter's going to get up and he's going to testify. Brother Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by the mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. See, that's what Peter's telling them. Now, Peter's the apostle to the Jews. He's standing up in the Jewish council, and he's telling them, listen, we have heard that God made a choice for the Gentiles to have the gospel and sent Paul with it. Yes. Pretty much in the debate, right? You would think so anyway, right? So look at verse 11, if you would. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Peter said, listen, we believe as Jews that we're going to get saved the same way the Gentiles are getting saved with Paul. Amen. So what do we learn from that? See, and that, that's what he says. In other words, this message had to be repeated over and over again. They had to re-emphasize this over and over again. Uh, if you go to Galatians chapter 2, you have it there in your notes. I didn't give it all to you, but I would challenge you to read all of it, verses 1 through 10. But we'll just read the first two verses there. Then 14 years after, are you listening to me? 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, this is Paul talking here, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Now you can go on and read the rest of those eight verses there in chapter 2 there of Galatia, and that will give you a little idea what's going on. And so we find out this is what's happening and what's taking place. And folks, it's no different today. We are still having to say over and over again that you get saved by grace and grace alone. Amen. And yet there's such a debate today about it and still goes on to this very day. And so you see, folks, that's why at this church we have to keep preaching the message of salvation. We have to keep preaching it over and over and over again. No different than what they did. So praise the Lord. If it was good enough for Paul and Silas and Barnabas and Peter, then it's good enough for this church. So, so we get to verse 13. Look at verse 13 with me. 
And after they had held their peace, ah, James gets up. Now, James is the leader of the church of Jerusalem. They're at the council. So our brother James, who happens to be the brother of Jude, who happens to be the half-brother of Jesus, all right, so you kind of get an idea of some credentials here, who's writing, all right, and talking. James stands up and answers and saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. In other words, listen up, fellas. Okay? Simon had declared how that God at first did visit the Gentiles to, to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. And this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of the men might seek after the Lord. And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all of these things. James is now telling us and assuring us that this gospel message is for the Gentiles. Okay. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is, now this, he's, actually he's going to write a letter, that we trouble them not. Now James writes a letter here, okay, is what's, what's going on here. James is going to take from this council now, and he's going to write a letter to all of these places. And he's going to send it with Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and Luke and these missionary teams as they go out now and begin to get ready to start this second missionary journey. And they're going to take this letter from James of these instructions uh, to these churches where they're at, especially to the Jewish brethren, and telling them that we are not going to put these Gentile believers believers under yoke. We're not going to put them under bondage and put them under a yoke like our forefathers did that we couldn't even bear and do up. We're not going to put it under them. And so here's what we're going to do. And James under the Holy Spirit writes a letter and it's given to these guys and they're going to take it with them. So just to give you a little idea of what's going on, you see that there, so let's move on. Paul and Barnabas separated over John Mark, if you remember that. You can read that in Acts 15 and 19 there. All right, as you read about what happens there with those guys, they're going to kind of separate there and they, they split and take off. And, and that's no problem. No problem because now we got two missionary teams. And we end up with four before this is over with. So that's how God works. See, we can, see, see, folks, we can disagree and work it out and still serve God. See, and that's the way the church ought to handle it and do it. Not pull some of the stuff that's being pulled. Because all it does is hurt. Hurts everything. Hurts, hurts everything. Everybody. And nothing is accomplished by it. Work it out. Now, if Paul and Peter, I mean, these are our two top apostles. If these guys can work it out, then we can too. Huh? So Paul and Barnabas here, they're, 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 now we got some new missionary teams. And so we're going to get this letter with four restrictions. James is writing here, and he's going to give four restrictions that are going to be given down. Look at it, verses 19, 15, 9, and 10 there. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? James says, we're not going to put this on these Gentile believers because we couldn't believe it, bear it. We couldn't do it. Our forefathers couldn't do it. And so that's, we're not going to do it. And you'll see why in just a minute. Here's why we're not going to do it. So, he put, so when you get into it, verses 19 through 21 and verse 29, we read what the four restrictions are. So before we get to them here in just a minute, let's read verses 19 through 21. Drop down to verse 19 now. Now this is James's letter that's going to be given to Paul and these guys that they're going to get ready to get on a ship and take a 1,600-mile journey. Okay? Uh, we're going to go there. Wherefore? My sentence is, this is my letter, this is what James is saying, that we trouble not them, that is, we trouble not uh, these Gentile believers, uh, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. So these Gentiles that have been saved now and turned to God, we're not going to trouble them. But that we will write unto them, so here's what he's going to write unto them, that they abstain, now here, here it is, here's the four restrictions. See, we're not going to put this yoke on them. We're not going to put them under this bondage of all of these rituals and practices and the law of Moses and all of this stuff and circumcision and everything that went with it. We're not going to do that to them. But we are going to give them some counsel. We are going to give them some exhortation. 
All right, we're, we're going to give them some restrictions. Verse 20, but that we write unto them that they abstain. Here's the first restriction. They abstain from pollutions of idols. All right, in other words, you know what they were to do? Here were the four restrictions. Okay, they were, uh, the four restrictions were part of pagan practices and worship, by the way. These four restrictions that he's going to put on them and tell them they're not to do these things and participate in these things because it was all part of pray of pagan worship. Amen? Amen? Not supposed to be involved in pagan worship. And so here he goes. Here's the first one. The first one there, he says, food given to idols. We're not going to abstain. They are to abstain from pollutions of idols. In other words, not to be given food to idols. He says there is but one God and one God only. You see, when we start giving food to idols, we're giving food and worshiping pagan gods. And he says, we're not going to do that, and we're not going to put them on that. Okay? Do you remember they practiced that in the Old Testament? This is some of the stuff that the Jews did and participated in the Old Testament, and God never approved of it. Okay? All right, and so then look at the second restriction. I think this is a good one here, too. That they, are, that they are to abstain from fornication. Hey, is everybody with me on this? Now, listen to that. Now, we're talking about believers that are getting saved. Gentiles specifically, but Jews as well, getting saved, coming to Christ. The body of Christ is forming. Churches are being formed. And, and James, under the Holy Spirit, says, now listen. We're, not, we're, we're going to give them four restrictions that they don't need to practice and put and bring into their worship hour. We don't need to bring that into our worship hour either. Okay? He said they are to abstain from sexual immorality. They're to live a pure life. A pure life. Now, as I said this morning in the message, that's why I didn't want to keep going because I was afraid I'd get into this. What's happened with the church today in this area of immorality? It's become a commonplace thing. It's, become, it's being accepted. It's being tolerated. It's being approved, condoned. And I mean from churches, pastors, deacons, you name it, staff. doesn't make any difference who it is. Church members. God wants you and I to live a pure life, a holy life, and he wants us to abstain from sexual sins. Period. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's still in the Bible. Amen. Flee fornication. Fornication is immorality. That's any kind of sexual sins. That's not to be going on in the church. Amen. You go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and Paul writes a letter. He says, I wrote to you an epistle, which was part of this. He says, I wrote to you an epistle not to company. The word company means to fellowship. Now, he's writing to the church of Corinth. These are Gentiles that were bringing their practices into the church. Okay? He said, I'm telling you, church members, you're not to company, you're not to fellowship with men and women in the church, teenagers, I don't care who they are, that are involved in sexual immorality. Do not company with them. Do not fellowship with them. Now, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 9. Let's turn to it. Might be here all night, but that's all right. This is so important. Everybody in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? Don't you think we ought to have moral excellence in the church? Huh? Don't you think we ought to have morality in the church today? But yet, where's it going? We allow anything and everything to go and happen. Folks, that, that, that's not Bible. That's not biblical. And, and, and listen to me, dear sweet people, I love every one of you, and I love your family, but hey, if you've got a family member involved in that, you're not to fellowship with them. But we got families that, oh, just, oh, no, this is my family, this is my son, this is my daughter, I mean, blah, 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 uh, you know, and, 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 and you know, th th this is the way I think it should be, and this is how I think it ought to go. So, see, that's what you think, but what God says is what counts. See, this is the final authority. Folks, it's not your reasoning or mine, it's what Revelation says. Now, let's read what Revelation says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. Everybody in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? Okay, the whole chapter deals with immorality. The whole chapter, 
All 11, 13 verses. But we come to verse number 9. And Paul says here, I wrote unto you an epistle, not to company. Now you can look up the word company, and it means to fellowship. means to run with, hang out with, play with. All right? With what? Fornicators. That's any immoral. Now he's talking about lost people here right now. All right? Believers, you're not to run with the crowd. Immoral people. Yet, not all together with fornicators, immoral people of this world, or of the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must needs go out of the world. Verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, not to run with, play with, fellowship, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. Immoral person, immorality. They're messing around in it and in it, and you know it. You're not to fellowship and company with them. This is what the God's Word says. Nor covetous, nor an idolater, a railer, drunk, or extortioner. He puts more in there for the believer than he did the lost man. Look at here. He adds a little more bonus to it. With such a one, no, not to eat. This is Revelation. This isn't the pastor's words. This is revelation. For what, have we, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? That's the lost, lost outside the church. Do not ye judge them that are within? See, we're to judge those within the church that are in immorality. But them that are without, what's going to happen? Look at verse 13. God judges. Now watch this, because God's going to judge them from without. Look what he says. Therefore, put away from you among yourselves that wicked person. God calls that person a wicked person. And he says for you to put them out. Now why is that? Go back to verse 1 of chapter 5. Let's see what else is going on. It is reported common, listen to that word, commonly. This immorality is going on in the church. It's reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Well, what kind of fornication is going on? And such fornication... This type of fornication and sexual immorality that's going on is not even much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. You understand what's going on? There's a sexual affair going on between a son and a mother or a son-in-law and a mother in the church, and the church knows about it because it's commonly being reported that this is going on in the church. Hello. And look what verse 2 says. And you are puffed up. You're a braggart. You're, you're flattered about this. You've you got egos. Have not rather, you've not mourned about this sin, that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that had done this deed, this deed of immorality, having sex and sexual affair with his mother or mother-in-law or son-in-law, what's going on in the church. Now, in the name, notice Paul now, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Why aren't we doing that today? Instead, we tolerate it. We go along with it. We put up with it. We say it's okay. The Bible says it's not okay. God hates sin. Amen. And here's the reason why. You're glorying. You're boasting. Look at verse 6. We don't read the word of God. Please don't just look up here and listen to my voice. Your glorying is not good. Your boasting about this and bragging about this going on in the church is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore. The old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So know what he says you need to do? 
you need to do some purging in the church. Because why? A little sin is going to affect the whole church. And when a little sin affects the whole church, we're all going to get judged for it. Now you see, a lot of people leave me. I'm not listening to that preaching over there. Well, that's your business. I'm just quoting the Bible. God's holy word. God's word is true. And God means what he means and says what he says, and he's going to do what he says he's going to do. In other words, you allow this going on all the time. Look out when God gets ready to judge that person. You're going to get the boom too. Because God is no respecter of persons. And if God has told us to purge and put it out and we haven't done it, then God has to deal with us because we've been disobedient. And God's going to bring chastening and chastisement on us that are disobedient. And we don't need immorality going on in the church. Especially if we know about it. And it's obvious. What about in your home? What if you've got immorality going on in your home? And you know it. And you're allowing it. And you're condoning it. And you're letting it happen. You've just put yourself under God's judgment. Now don't get mad at me. I love you because I tell you the truth. And you wonder why things aren't working out in your family. Why things aren't happening. Or why a lot of things are happening to you. Do you ever stop to realize you may be under the judgment of God. Because you have not dealt with the very thing God has told you to deal with. See, God's no respecter. He doesn't care if it's your family or not. God doesn't, God's not looking at that. God's looking at the sin. You can't be letting immorality, sexual sins, going on inside your roof, under your house. Men, if you're here, you are the spiritual leader of your home. And God holds you and I responsible for what goes on in our home. And if we allow this to go on in our home, God's going to spank the daylights out of us. And I say this according to the authority of God's word. Because it's our responsibility to make sure that that's not happening. And God says to put them out, put them out from among you. God calls it wicked. And you can go on and keep reading on a little bit further on. And the Apostle Paul comes back and says, one of the biggest reasons why we're to do all of this, it is to bring them to their shame for the lifestyle that they're living and what they're doing. And it ought not be going on in the church and it ought not be going on in our homes. I didn't want to get into that this morning. Because I knew we'd have to be touching it a little bit tonight. Because my brother James wrote me a letter that's been passed down through these missionaries from church to church. And says there's some restrictions that you're to have in the church. And one of them is you're not to to give food, uh, food uh, to sacrifice to idols. Idol worship, idolatry. That's paganism. Secondly, you're not allowed to have fornication, immorality going on in the church. You can go to 2 Thessalonians 3.14 if you want to. Write that one down. You can go look at it later. All right, another one. Strange an- strangled animals. They weren't to take and, and, and offer and participate with strangled animals. That was paganism. They weren't supposed to do that. And then they weren't supposed to participate in drinking blood. Hello. That's pagan practice. Now, how many of you know of a religion today that does that? One of the biggest in the country, in the world. That when you take the sacraments at the Lord's Supper, that the wine that you are taking is literally physically turning into the blood of Jesus. That's pagan practice. And the wafer that you're eating is literally the body of Christ. That's called cannibalism. And that's also forbidden in the scripture. You see, folks, you can kill me, but you can't eat me. That's against the law. It's against the law to kill me, too. You see how all this stuff has crept into the church? And through the years, and nobody has stood up to say anything about it, or those that have have been criticized and condemned and run out of town and run out of Dodge and and everything else, and yet we've had good men stand in the pulpit and say, Thus saith the Lord so James wrote the letter 
He said, here's the letter that I'm writing. Here's the restrictions, and I'm going to give it to these apostles, and they're going to take it back on this next missionary trip. And they're going to go back to all the first places they went, and then as they go out further. You remember the first time they went was 1,500 miles. Now they're going 3,000 miles. You remember the first trip was $17,000. This trip's costing $23,000. The first trip was about 52 days. This is 100 days. So we're basically doubling what's going to take place here. So James writes this letter of these restrictions. And now the reason for the restrictions were they were meant to build harmony between the Jews and the Gentiles. See, we need to have harmony in the church. Not division, not splitting, but harmony. Okay, and, and, another, and the, the restrictions were meant to promote peace and to defer to other convictions that we ought to have. We ought to have good, godly, biblical convictions. Which one of them would be not to have immorality in the church. Can you imagine that? A son or son-in-law is having sex with his mother in the church and the church is bragging about it? We're in bad shape. That's why people come to this little church and they go, this is church? And it's then church we go to. One we go to, man, you can do anything you want. Have anything you want, wear anything you want, act any way you want to, and just carry on like all get out, man. We have a great, fantastic time. Yeah, but the Spirit of God's not there. The power of God's not there and the Holy Spirit's not there, I can tell you that. Oh, there's a Spirit there. But it's not that it's the Spirit of Antichrist. Oh, you're too old-fashioned, old fuddy-duddy, and you live back in the dinosaur ages. Come on up to the 21st century. No, I'm not going to. No, sorry. You're looking for all that. You have to go somewhere else for now anyway. Okay, and they were not given as a means to gain salvation, because remember, that was the debate. The whole debate was is that you could not be saved apart from circumcision. And all this that was going on in this debate at Jerusalem. So James, under the Holy Spirit, says we're going to write a letter. We're going to agree with Peter. And we're going to take this stand that you're saved by grace and grace alone. And that the Gentiles are going to be saved by grace. And we Jews are going to get saved the same way they do, by grace. And not all of this stuff. So praise God they went that way. Amen. So you see, we don't do all these restrictions, folks, to gain salvation. You see, that was only by the grace of God, salvation. All right, are you with me? So here it goes. The second missionary journey begins, and 13.4, I want you to just read 13.4a, because that goes back to the first missionary journey there at, the, at Antioch, and that's where they were laying on of the hands, and they sent Paul and Barnabas out, which was Saul at that time. His name was still Saul, and they laid hands on them, and they sent them out in the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, so we're getting ready to go again. So this missionary took a journey here that took place somewhere between 49 and 52 AT, and it was Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy were involved in this second missionary journey you have there. 49 to 52 AD uh, in this time time frame that was taken. And you have your map there that you look at. Then we also see that the total travel would have been about 3,050 miles, about 3,050 miles on this mission trip. Uh, we see that they had, it would take about 100 days. And so, you know, that's five months, close to five months. All right, or four months. That's four months out, all right? And uh, so we find that. And then we see that the travel uh, time with ship and foot and supplies and everything was about $23,000. Now, that's what it be, would be equivalent to what it would be today. Back then, that's what they would have spent, about twenty-three grand. And you can see where they're all going, and uh, just turn around here a little bit for you, and, and look at your map here, and it's time to get going here, and uh, you know, they're going to start over here, uh, and they're, they're going to go up here, and they're going to end up over here to Tarsus, and then they're going to go over to Derby and Lystra, and Iconium, back over here to Antioch, and Perga here, and, and then of course this is Galatia in this area here, and then they're eventually going to take off, and they're going to go over here to Troas, all right, and then they're going to go from Troas here uh, as they're heading towards into Greece and Macedonia. Over here, over here is Macedonia and Greece. Over here, modern day today, and they're going to get over here to Philippi. And right here is what they call the Church of Philippi. This was the Philippians. This was the gateway to Europe. 
right here. This is where the crossroads were and met with the Roman Empire and all of that. And here was the crossroads right here to Philippi. And they go on down here to Berea and Thessalonica and Achaia down here and on, on down here to Corinth. You see, and eventually down here with all of the gospel. And then they come back across to Ephesus over here, which is all modern day Turkey today. And right on and back to back here, back to Antioch. That was their trip, and that's the journey you see there, and we find all of this in chapter 16, uh, as we see that as they begin to take this trip, and Paul went to Derby and Lystra, and, and there they hooked up with Timothy uh, on their journey, and uh, they had great respect for Timothy, even though his mother was Jewish. His father was a Greek. Uh, he was circumcised before they traveled, and it wasn't because he had to. It was just a choice he made, all right? And then we find next that, that Paul and them traveled again, and they uh, ended up over at Troas, which you saw there on your map, and we'll be back to it in just a minute. And then uh, from, from there, they went down to Galatia, over over into Troas, which is all in that area right there where I showed you that same area. Then they begin to travel over to Greece, to Macedonia, which was Macedonia, which is modern-day Greece today in that area. And they went into Philippi. And they got over there to Philippi there. And we find that over in chapter 16 now. And you find them over in uh, verse number 12. And from thence to Philippi. And so now they're over in Philippi. That's uh, there on your number uh, three there of your outline there on page four that you're looking at as we're wrapping this up for the evening here. And from thence to Philippi, uh, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. See, that's, uh, that's where Macedonia is in great. That's the, in your map you saw there. That's what they considered the gateway to Europe. Okay, and, and that's where they would go. And, and, and there was a colony there. And we were in that city abiding certain days. And so what happens here is as they're taking place in this city here, they're traveling to Greece, and they stayed at Philippi for several days, and that's where they met the Lady of Purple, Lydia. You remember that story in the book of Acts? We see that, and on the Sabbath day, they went out of the city by the riverside, were praying, and was wrought to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the woman uh, which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira there, uh, which was worshipped, God heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and that she attended to the things which we were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, in other words, she, she got saved. Lydia got saved. When she got saved, she got baptized. See, that's what you do. You follow the Lord in believer's baptism, okay? And so that takes place. And, and if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And so they went back to Lydia's house. And, and the story goes on as you read about what happens. But before it's all over with, Lydia gets saved and her whole household gets saved. I mean, you see, so this is, this is what's happening as the gospel is going as these men are sent out and they're going from place to place and they run into some opposition. They have some debates. They have some arguments and then get settled out. And yet that doesn't discourage them. They don't quit, give up. We keep going. You see, we'll resolve these issues even if we have to do it later. But what's more important is the gospel. What's more important is the cause of Christ. What's more important is the church and the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. Settle our differences later, but don't hurt the church and the cause of Christ and the body of Christ and the bride of Christ and the sons and daughters of God. Don't do that. There isn't anything we can't solve in the name of Jesus. That is, if we're going to be spiritual and mature like we're supposed to be and act like it. Why? Because there's a greater cause. Isn't that what he says? Is there not a cause? Do we not have a greater cause? But see, problem is people get focused on themselves and oh, poor oh me and blah, blah, blah this and blah, blah, blah that and everything else and they can't see straight because it's all about them. And who gives a hoot about the cause of Christ? No wonder we can't reach our world for Christ. My goodness. But boy, they, they, they saw her conversion and baptized and Lydia in her whole house. Man, that's fantastic. So Pilate and Silas, they were dragged before the city officials by this angry mob. They were beaten. We find that in, in verses 22 through 24. If you look down there in chapter 16 through 22 through 24, write it down in your Bible. I didn't give it to you, and I'm sorry there for that, okay? In number three there, Greece and Philippi, verses 13 through 15, uh, verse 12 there, and, and you, you, verse 1 and 3 starts out. Just take this all as chapter 16 and write it down. But in verses there, it says, in the, in the customs, uh, the follow, neither received a, observe being Romans, they didn't observe the fact that they were Romans. And they brought them before the magistrates, and they beat them, verse 22. 
And when they had laid them in stripes upon them, and they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, uh, who uh, having uh, received such a charge, he thrust them into the inner prison and made uh, their feet fast to the stocks. You see, now that's what happened there, number four, that they were beaten, all right? Then we move on to number five, and while they were in prison, Paul and Silas began singing. See, when you go through persecution, don't curse God, don't give up on God, don't blame God, don't quit on God. Start praising God and living for God because somebody around you is about to get saved. Come on, church, there's a jailer that's about to get saved. Lydia just got saved and her whole household got saved. And now there's a jailer that's going to get saved because these men are singing at midnight and God sends an earthquake, shakes off their shackles and their chains. The guard's ready to take his life because that's what would happen to him anyway. And they cry out and say, do thyself no harm for we are all here. And the man takes him out and he says, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou and thy house shall be saved. He took them back, bandaged up their wounds, and 42 people got saved. Hallelujah. Now, I'm trying to kindle the fire in you tonight. Okay, that's what it's all about. You read it. The jailer came to faith, and you put it down there of six now, that when the jailer came to faith, and all of his family, his household, was baptized and saved. That's verses 30 through 34. Write it down in your little notes there, 30 through 34. Okay? Then Paul and Silas were released, but they refused to go quietly. Now you'd think, man, after they let these guys go, after they beat them half to death, we'd kind of like get out of Dodge kind of quietly like. You know what I mean? Let's just, uh, you know, kind of forget this thing and let's move on, guys. Let's, let's move. No, no, we're not leaving. Because we are Roman citizens and you have beaten us unfairly without a proper trial and so forth. You're in trouble. They're Roman citizens. So, where are we at? Roman citizens, they've been mistreated. Amen? They were Roman citizens. Now look down at verse 40 with me in chapter 16, if you would. We're, we're done. Verse 40. Everybody in verse 40? And they went out of the prison, this is Paul and them, Silas, and they entered into the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they confronted them, and they departed. All right, now, are you with me? Go back to verse 5 of chapter 16. Everybody in verse 5 of chapter 16? Let me find it here. Where are verse 6, verse 5. And so were the churches established in faith and increased in number, how often, church? Daily. Daily. Do you see what was happening, what was going on? I'll back this up a little bit for us. Oh, there we go. As a result of all of this, the gospel was being spread. Then they went over to here to Troas, jumped on a ship, crossed the Aegean Sea here, Ended up in Philippi. Lydia gets saved. Her household gets saved. They get beaten for a cause of Christ. Get thrown in jail. The jailer and his whole household, 42 people get saved. There's like over 60 people got saved in that ordeal. And the, and the churches begin to spread and, and jump all over. You come down here to Berean and then Thessalonica. And then on down here to Achaia here. Or Achaia. And, you know, and then they come on down here. And here's the church of Corinth. And you know, back over here to Ephesus and down on around. And I mean, and this is what's... Fire has been rekindled, and churches are being established daily. And that's why the Bible says in Acts, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as were saved. Amen. Folks, this is what it's all about. It's getting people saved and born again. Not fighting and arguing with each other. Not getting our feelings hurt. Getting a chip on our shoulder. Somebody says something, so what? Work it out later. Don't damage the cause of Christ and the work of Christ over it. It's not worth it. That's not worth it. Now, you've got a good biblical scriptural reason to pack up and go, then go. But you go crunch, crunch, confront the pastor. Talk to him. See if you can't work it out. But I want to tell you something. About, there are only about three good biblical uh, reasons to go. That's if the pastor's preaching Pharisee and, do, and, and not sound doctrine, false doctrine, false teaching heresy, that's the time to question him. And if he's going to continue, it's either he goes or you go. 
Simple as that. If the pastor is embezzling money, misappropriating God's funds and misusing God's funds and God's money, I mean, and really doing it, messing it up, and he's confronted by the church and so forth, chooses not to stop, then it's time to make a decision. It's either time for him to move on or for you to move on. Because if not, the church will be broke in no time. That doesn't honor God, and then it doesn't accomplish God's work. We're to be good stewards of the funds that God has given us. We're to be good managers of it. And I think a third good biblical reason is to leave. If the pastor's involved in immorality, it's time for him to move on, or I'm moving on. Amen. As simple as that. Now, if that's not going on, then you need to stay right where you're at, and you need to work it out, and get things resolved and solved, and serve the Lord, and get your eyes on Christ and what's going on. There's always going to be problems in the church. Amen. I don't care where you go. Well, we can solve things and work things out, but you can't if you don't really need to talk about it, if you're not willing to go up and confront people with it, and sit down with people, and say, what's the problem? I mean, my goodness, so somebody said something to you, you got your feelings hurt? Did they shoot your fo- dog? I mean, that's not worth fighting over, the, you know? I mean, unless they shot your dog or something, then that's worth fighting over. But sometimes we act like they killed our children. When it was over something dumb and stupid. So you see, they had their problems. They had their challenges. And they had to work it out. And they had to have a council meeting at the Church of Jerusalem with James the head of it. All the boys showed up. And the bad guys showed up too. And so they had a big discussion. Peter gets up and says, hey, this is the way it is. James gets up and says, this is the way it is, and this is the way we're going. So that's it. You false teachers and prophets don't like it? Out. Thank God for it. Amen. I get excited about all these mission trips and journeys. Now, this is Paul's second missionary journey. Next week, Lord willing, we'll look at the third one. And we're going to see again how, the, how, the, how it begins to spread and the church begins to grow and people are getting saved and churches are popping up everywhere. That's why when they went to the Isle of Crete, you remember right here, the Isle of Crete? Okay, Paul and Silas went over there and spent a long time over there on that island. A uh, wealthy island, matter of fact, but pagan. Went over there, man, they led multitudes of Christ, established churches all up and down that island. And then Paul says, I'm out of here. And Titus goes, oh, what do you mean you're out of here? Now, you're going to stay here and set things in order. All by myself? All by yourself, because i got to go. God's called me somewhere else. Good way of getting out of it, isn't it? It's always the Lord's will led you somewhere else. Amen? And so, 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 so Titus, he stays, on the isle of, uh, he stays on the Isle of Crete there, and, and, and his job is to appoint elders. And, and that the churches they established and, get thing, and set things in order. And Paul says, I'll be back later to check on things and see how things are doing. And that's what they were doing here in the beginning as they come out of here and up through here. These are where they'd already been on the first missionary journey. And so they were stopping back by, rekindling the fire in those churches and, and believers, and, and then moving on. As we've got work to do. See, that's what missionaries are to do. Missionaries are to go and plant and establish churches and then move on. And you call in the locals now to be the pastors of those churches. Amen. Love missions. And it is what this, this is phenomenal. And we're just touching the surface of it because we could be here for a long time. A long time. Just in this little part of Acts. Acts is 28 chapters. It's the Acts of the Apostles. We could have a two solid year study in it. Even three. It's that rich. But we're just touching the missionary journeys of the church that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the church is on fire and it's on the move. And God's moving. And if God's moving, I want to move with Him. Amen? Amen. If God's moving, I want to move in it. I want to get on His ship and go with Him. Wherever He's going. And I know what He wants to do. He wants to win souls. He wants to baptize them and then disciple them. And go out and win some more. And go out and win some more. That's why Philip, on the first one, if you remembered, Philip led, led that eunuch to Christ. He goes back to Ethiopia there in South, down in South Africa and becomes an evangelist, an evangelist and begins to evangelize all of Ethiopia. Well, we need to be evangelizing our city. We need to be evangelizing our county as much as we can through tracks, door knocking, inviting, personal, phone calling, Television, radio, internet, YouTube, iPhones, iPads. We need to be out there with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
That's our mission. That's our madness. It's the gospel. Get it out. Get it out. So the Lord can tell us one day, church, all you West Marionites, we're going to be part of the Ite tribes. You know, so many Ites. Head tights, the Jebusites, the head Ites, the head tights, the flea bites, you know, all of the parasites. There's all kinds of Ites. We're going to be the West Marionites. And the Lord looks at us and says, all you West Marionites, come over here. Now, I want you to turn around and I want you to see that crowd. I want you to look around for great is your reward. They're here because you had a vision to reach them with the gospel. And you sacrificed and you did without to take the gospel out. There's your reward. All you West Marianites, look up here at me. It's the Lord talking now. Well done. Good job, guys. Yes! It will be worth it all. We have a cause, church, and the cause is to reach our world for Christ. However we can. So let's do it. Let's get a fire burning in us that won't stop. If it gets kindled down, let's get it rekindled. Let's add a little fuel. Let's get a buff bellows and blow on it a little bit and fan it and get it going. Because we got a lot to get saved. And we got a short time to do it in. Short time. And we have greater opportunities than those guys. It took them 100 days to go 1,600 miles. I got to travel last night 2,500 miles in 60 minutes. 25,000 miles. That's what the circumference around the globe is, is 25,000 miles. When they live streamed our program last night, it went around the 25,000 miles around the world in that hour. So Father, as we go from this place tonight, thank you for these men that dedicated their lives to beatings, to jails, to prison, for the cause of Christ, for the gospel. Thank you that they could iron things out in a meeting come together in a council, get it resolved and continue the work so that the work would not stop or be hindered. Perhaps tonight the trumpet could sound and Jesus would come in the clouds of glory for his church and we'd go home to be with you. And Lord, if not in the meantime, there is a cause. And Lord, help us to do our part to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.